I'm wrapping up season one of Let the Verse Flow, but I promise you I'm ending with a bang. I've created a new series on journaling that I'll release this month, December. These bonus episodes on the benefits of journaling and the hows and whys of starting a journaling practice will include a 30-day journal challenge, so you can kick off the new year right. Stay tuned as these bonus episodes will air bi-weekly on Wednesdays, just like my regular episodes do. I also want to let you know that when I first started this podcast, I had no idea how much personal fulfillment it would bring me. It has helped me process some of the grief I felt over my mother's illness, and it has brought incredible people into my life, painters, journalers, teachers, writers, and entrepreneurs that came flooding in with praise for the podcast, offers to collaborate, and new ideas for upcoming episodes. To every person listening now, please know how grateful I am that you take the time to make room for my stories, my spoken word poetry, and my musical wonderings. It has been an amazing first season for me, and I hope to have inspired your personal growth journey along the way. I'll return for season two on January 17th with a lineup of new episodes. There won't be any pause in the shows. Bi-weekly Wednesdays are my jam. So please listen to the next two bonus episodes on journaling and start your 30-day journaling challenge. The links to a ton of resources on journaling will be available in the show notes of those episodes. However you celebrate, relax, have fun, and make time and space for your needs. I'm hoping the next month is good to you. Don't forget to make time for your own good company, to sit with your journal and dive deep into your thoughts in a meaningful way. Happy holidays! There's an engine that's pushing us forward. We call it progress, but it could just be momentum. Consumption is all consuming, but we want more. A shiny new toy, we must have it. And for a moment it holds, keeps us upright and feeling proud and bold. Perceived wealth piled up like crusty snow mixed with salt. We love external measures, How much do you have, and is it more than me? While internal treasures, how's your soul? Did you share it today, though unexplored and undervalued? We are pushing for sure, but are we going up? Is our growth collective, or siloed and moved around by forces we know not? For some have lots, while others have none. We look outwards all day long, and I wonder, is it because looking inward would have us too far gone? All shiny and bright, that's what we want. But earthly things are dull and brown, but deep and full, so full of life. While we look at our pile of things, does not our mind stay unaware of what does matter as we false compare? Let's bring it back so we can find the riches beneath the surface, connections that run deep, to make even poor lives turn rich, and unfinished look complete. Today we're going to talk about a thief in the night. It steals our joy right from under our noses. It's comparison that robs us And mostly it's built on faulty assumptions and half-truths. I'll explain. I'm Jill Hodge, writer and host of Let the Verse Flow, a bi-weekly personal growth podcast where I share my special mixtape of stories, poems, and music that's designed to help you turn your struggles into strength. It's a new brand of self-improvement. The opinions I express here are my own and not a substitute for professional help. If you need someone to talk to, please reach out to a mental health professional. Now, sit back and relax 
and listen to my reflections from the bright side of the bee. Do you have more than me, or do I have more than you? We rarely think of that question in terms of our internal resources, our emotional stability, our self-esteem, or our innate talents. No, we look at the surface level and the packaging. Do you look better than I do? Do you have nicer clothes, a, a better home, more friends, and the option of travel to beautiful places? Perhaps we comb through our social media feed at night. We tell ourselves it's entertainment, but usually it's either zoning out or comparison shopping. Can I do that latest dance like they do? If I use that product, will I have hair that looks like hers? How many followers does he have, and what do I have to do to get that many? Why don't I already have them? I call this comparison shopping. It's like we're looking for and trying on a better life. But in the process, we're neglecting our own life. Where does comparison shopping get us? And do we want to go there? Is another person's life better than ours? Or are we simply unaware of their struggles? Have you noticed that we rarely create reels or stories that highlight our hard times? Now we post the photos and videos that show us in our best life. And that's part of human nature, but it means that what we are seeing as we consume social media is the best and brightest. We rarely see the process, the hard work, or the outtakes and retries. So how do we measure success and accomplishments in ways that add to our lives instead of taking away from them? I've been questioning myself because, let's face it, I'm watching those highlight reels before bed too. I'm comparing my podcast download numbers to others too. I'm looking at those cool cargo pants. I could go on, but you get the picture. This is very much an us problem, but it's one that I work to temp down and rein in by reminding myself of some core values and beliefs, and I'll go into those later. But first, we all compare ourselves to others. Um, there's even a theory to explain it. It's called social comparison theory. We have a natural tendency to compare ourselves to others, and it can come with both benefits and problems. We do an upward social comparison where we compare ourselves to people we think have greater skill or accomplishments in an area, like maybe me comparing myself to more experienced podcasters. That may motivate me. It may give me an aspirational vision. But if taken too far, it may cause me to feel bad about my progress, which could be slower and more at the beginner level. But what I know for sure is that if I don't reason the comparison through and understand my stage of development in relation to theirs, I'm going to feel some kind of way about it. And it's usually not a good feeling. So that's upward social comparison. But there's also downward social comparison. When I compare what I have or can do with other people who don't have as much skill or accomplishment in those areas as I do. And this may make me feel better about myself for a bit, but usually that feeling is brief because it doesn't really make me feel that great to think that others aren't as skilled. Somehow I identify with them and know that they probably want to grow and take steps forward too. So anyway, these comparisons we make are relative to other people. Uh, and I've linked an article in the show notes about social comparison theory and these concepts of upward and downward comparison, if you want to learn more about this. Um, but we now have a worldwide scale with which to compare ourselves to others through social media. Now, I consume social media as much as the next guy but I've noticed a pattern. Social media, I feel best and most invigorated by it on Friday nights. That's when I find new music for my playlists. Oh yeah, the hunt has begun. I can spend hours hunting down new music. 
I go through my beloved SoundCloud app to find new music. Do you use SoundCloud? If you like um, hip hop, electronica, new beats, remixes, and music collaborations, I think it's the best platform I've found. I'm a huge SoundCloud fan. I have a free account, and while it has ads in between some of the songs on playback, it feels more like an open collective of music than other streaming platforms. Plus, I can listen to songs in the order I want for free. Can I afford the paid plan? Yes, but I'm frugal by nature, and I get plenty of great music without a paid plan, so I'm good. So on Friday or Saturday night, I look through the new releases and add songs to my core ongoing playlist. And this music will be my companion on walks to work, during dance sessions in my house, and while doing chores. I also go on Instagram and look at reels of DJs, dancers, and other music-related content. So Friday night's social media consumption is all about music, sometimes Saturdays as well. And I usually post these to my stories on Instagram and I would say for about an hour or so, I reminisce about the days when my weekends were defined by music and dancing. So you can check out some of my musical finds by following me on Instagram or by listening to my season one music video playlist on YouTube, um, both at Let the Verse Flow. I grew up into adulthood in the 80s and beginning around the age of 17, I started to go to dance clubs in New York and there were many. The Tunnel, Webster Hall, Area, Kamikaze, Limelight, the Palladium, Emerald City. There were tons of clubs to go to, but my favorite was Studio 54. Now, young listeners may not have heard of this club, but if you're in your 40s, you know what I'm talking about. Studio 54 was the club. Now, Studio 54 really had its heyday in the 70s. Um, But even during its last years of existence in the 80s, when my boyfriend and I went dancing there most weekends, it was still a fabulous club. It wasn't the Studio 54 of the 70s where it was so exclusive and nobody could get in and, you know, they had the velvet rope and the stanchions and all, but um, it was still a great, great club. And two things made Studio 54 really special. And I have carried the memory of these two things ever since they first came into my life when I was about 17. So throughout my whole life, these two memories are just so vivid. And first is that every type of person, every gender, every age, every kind of soul went and enjoyed the dance floor at Studio 54. Towards the end of the club's popularity, it wasn't as selective and who could get in And they started distributing sort of entry passes, special like summer passes, which I had one of. So you didn't have to stand outside at the rope stanchion and wait to be picked to get in. You could use your pass and just go in. And once I got in at 17 years old, it felt like the most inclusive place I had ever been to. And honestly, nothing has matched it since. You see, the dance floor was a melting pot of people who loved to party to dance, to express themselves, and yes, to get a little fucked up and carried away. But I felt completely accepted on the dance floor, and there was never a feeling of judgment or comparison. You just took everything in and enjoyed the eye candy, and you just celebrated freedom. You brushed up against each other with acceptance and community. And whoever you were, If you felt good on the dance floor, you belonged. If you wanted to dance, if you wanted to move, if you wanted to feel the music on the dance floor, you could just do that. No one was watching you. Nobody was comparing themselves to you. It was just a free, free party. And you were a member of the club. And honestly, we were like a motley crew. But I loved how free I felt on nights at Studio 54. The other thing was that the club was a sensory playland. The lighting was fabulous. They had these columns that would be wrapped in different colors that would vibrate and pulse to the to the beat of the music. Um, the sound system was incredible, and that beat in unison with my heart. I just would boom, boom, the bass would come on, and I just felt my whole body sort of like waken. It just was 
fully awake when I was in that club and that sound system was just incredible. And then smoke billowed from below at just the right moments. And you'd look down and the smoke would be rising. You're just like, it was the greatest thing. And if we were lucky, very late into the night or sometime early morning, there would appear a pulsating pendulum with a heart on the bottom of it that swung above our heads. And it would swing over heads and it would go whoosh and then swing on the other side, whoosh. And the cool air would travel above us. And I've never seen anything so magical since, but that lit heart, it had a red heart. The lights would go on and off in unison with the beat and in this lit heart on the pendulum just capped off the night. And it signified our collective love. At least that's what it signified to me. Um, our love of dance, of music, of freedom, and our love for each other. I'm sure there were comparisons being made. You know, we appreciated fabulous fashion or fancy dance moves for sure, but it was not at the sake of looking down at others or inwards to belittle ourselves. We admired the beauty. We bathed in it. So Fridays with music bring back these fabulous memories for me. And when I'm consuming social media in this context, I'm not engaging in negative comparisons. But that got me thinking, should I stop using social media when it's not focused on these Friday music sessions? How can I reduce comparisons that are harmful to my mental well-being? You see, comparison can affect our mental health. Social comparison can be a way to self-evaluate or monitor but while some comparison can have a positive effect on our motivation, other types of comparison can negatively impact the way we feel about ourselves. While it's often based on a surface understanding of another person's perceived wealth without understanding their personal, family, emotional struggles, the price we pay for taking things at face value may make us feel less than. We may be comparing ourselves to someone else without understanding what they may be struggling with, you know, that perceived wealth or knowing the story of how their connections or circumstances help them receive those things. And if you are comparing yourself to images or videos on social media, you are seeing the high points in someone's life. And this one-sided view often leaves out their struggles or inadequacies. I mean, how many times have you posted a story or reel about how awful you feel or how something negative happened to you? Rarely, if ever, everyone, and I'm including myself in here, is trying desperately in some cases to show their best selves on social media. But we don't live in our best selves throughout the day. We live in an imperfect state. And so our comparison is usually based on a fallacy from the very start. Whether I'm making an upward social comparison or a downward social comparison, after a momentary observation is made, I think it's best to just stay in your lane and not give too much thought to what others are doing. With the upward social comparison, you may be able to build some motivation to grow a particular skill by watching someone else exhibit it. You know, you can learn a bit that way, but sooner or later, hopefully sooner, you have to build your own systems and knowledge base. Once you've developed your skills in your own unique way, you don't need that comparison anymore. In fact, it may stifle your progress or limit your potential by boxing you into perceptions about an external reference. With a downward comparison, honestly, how good can you feel when you are doing something better than someone else and they're struggling to sort of keep up? especially if you know they are trying as hard as you to achieve something. It really doesn't make me feel good to see them struggle or fall behind in missing their goals. So I'm going to give you some examples from my life. Um, comparison has been a slippery slope for me. Um, as someone who grew up with modest means, I was always reminded that my single mother had to work two jobs to get me the things I wanted. Now, she never shamed me about my wanting things, but I was very aware of her sacrifice because she wasn't home much. I was a classic latchkey kid, 
and my mom left the house very early in the morning and returned late at night. Some of my first memories in daycare were being dropped off first in the morning and picked up last at night. But it was okay, because I knew my mom was coming for me, and I understood how hard she worked. But as a result, while I had many of the toys and stuff I wanted, what I really wanted was more time with her. As I grew up, I didn't need many flashy things, uh, with one exception, my collection of shiny shoes. I love patent leather, and so I have shiny shoes in many different colors, and they make me happy. <laughs> but I dress modestly and simply most of the time, and I know very well that what looks good on the outside can be rotten to the core on the inside. Sure, I dress up to celebrate or just for fun to feel good, but it's not something that drives my everyday routine. And I try to remember that looks fade, that looks are just that, that momentary outside perception. And sometimes what's going on beneath the surface doesn't look so pulled together. When I wrote this poem entitled, Not a Redwood Tree, my daughter was working in California and had the opportunity to hike among the beautiful redwood forests. Ordinarily, I would have been happy for her. A good nature walk is a beautiful thing. But I was struggling to feel close to her, and she was pushing me away, as teenagers often do. I worried that I was losing her as the world began to open up and show these beautiful layers to her. Would she need me and her dad as much? Would our life seem worthwhile? And would she be proud of it as she compared it to the lives she saw in California? I compared our life here with a redwood tree, and it looked lacking at first. And I wrote this poem to sort of reason through my conflicting thoughts. Not a redwood tree. A perfect circle, we are not. No beams of sunshine, we're a blot. No dewy perfection, we are matte, not bathed in sweet, warm maple sap. None of those things are us. No, no, not that. We are not a redwood tree staking claim to bold and tall. We bend, we fold, we break and fall. Never will we be perfect. We are mud, we are soul and earthly bound. No wings to fly, we claim them not. To flicker gold like ember flames. We offer simple deeds, everlasting love among trampled weeds. For perfection has no sway when life grew from blood-soaked days from teardrops that fall from skies of gray. We were not the best, but rose despite the field. We sowed our seeds among the weeds, surpass we did our mortal unrest, under a magenta sun setting south by west. Our love was wrapped in plain brown wrapper, but from tattered, simple, bare, there came the foundation for happily ever after. And as you look upon us now, please know that you've sprung up to shatter the family ceiling, because your path was forged from steel, perhaps dull, but surely solid and unyielding. I am not a redwood tree. That level of natural perfection and magnificence is grand and all-encompassing when compared to me. I look smaller in its shadow. So why bother comparing myself to a standard that I can't reach? I can't be that grand on the same terms as a redwood tree. So comparison steals my joy. When I wrote this poem, I was thinking about how our family life must have appeared imperfect to outsiders, and especially as seen through the eyes of our teenage daughter. How it looks when examined in contrast to the beautiful, lush landscape of the redwood forest. And yet as I wrote, I realized that I'm proud 
of the solid, stable, and even dull state of our family in comparison to the intricacies and riches of a dense forest, in the metaphor that came to mind. We may not look as inviting on the surface, but we function quite well beneath it. And that's what really matters in the end, how we love, how we provide support, how we connect to one another and how we enjoy our lives. So if you are comparing yourself to others and find yourself lacking, know that comparison can be a thief. It can rob you of your present moment. It's hard to be mindful in the moment you are living when you're focused your attention on what someone else has. You divert your attention away from self. And it's usually a losing battle. You lose when you compare yourself to others. And if you tie your self-worth to these comparisons, you lose an authentic and potentially positive way of seeing your life and your accomplishments. It can cause stress or resentment to build up around the person you are comparing yourself to. And it's hard to find a resolution to those feelings because they haven't done anything wrong to you. It's not like you had a fight and can try to resolve it. And you can get stuck in this one-sided loop fixating on a problem that's of your own making. Comparison can make us feel envious, guilty, regretful, defensive. It can reduce confidence and self-esteem and bring on feelings of isolation. And we can turn those negative feelings inward, affecting our overall mental health. If your self-esteem is low and you have a lot of personal stressors, you may be especially vulnerable to the negative effects of comparison. You may not be motivated by someone else's successes and turn against yourself to downgrade or berate yourself for not achieving what they have. This is like piling shit on top of your troubles. Don't do it to yourself. If you aren't in the best place right now, your goal should be to stay in your lane and try not to compare yourself to others. You may not have the capacity to look at someone else's success through a positive lens. It may not feel motivating to compare yourself with others right now, and that's okay. Look inward instead and protect your mental state by finding the good in this moment. Comparison can make us focus on the wrong things, especially outward appearance. People can look fine as hell on the outside. They may have great fashion sense and show a beautiful face to the rest of the world, but be totally bankrupt and broken on the inside. They may be struggling with challenges we know nothing about or have an interior mental state that isn't so bright. It's kind of like looking at a Monet painting. You know, from a distance, there's cohesion and refinement in the overall painting, but once you examine the work closely, you see the chunky brush strokes that may strike you as disheveled and uneven. Up close, things in a Monet painting appear abstract and disjointed, but from far away they are cohesive and realistic. And similarly, someone may look beautiful or pulled together at first glance or on the surface level, but be quite disheveled and unappealing when one digs beneath the surface. Well, only partially sort of related to this, I recently read a fun article by Sarah Beach over on a website called Left Brain Buddha. And this article compared what we learn and experience when meditating to Monet's paintings and impressionistic painting styles. It's called Five Ways Meditation is Like a Monet Painting. And I think it's a really fresh perspective on both meditation and our thoughts when meditating. And then it weaves in Monet's style and his philosophy about painting. And I love when sort of meditation and art come together. So if you're interested in a good read, I've left the link in the show notes. Uh, five ways meditation is like a Monet painting. Anyway, it comes down to that popular saying, don't compare your insides to someone's outsides. It's based on how distorted some comparisons can be, and this distorted view can sap our motivation and good feelings. On the other side, maybe that beautiful someone has beauty on both the inside and the outside. Shouldn't we celebrate that? 
Shouldn't we feel a collective sense of joy about that? Doesn't that elevate all of us in some ways? You know, a positive momentary comparison can feel good. For those of us who spend too much time comparing ourselves to others, I have a few ideas about what we should be doing instead. And yes, I'm going to take my own advice here by diverting some of my mindless social media time to these activities instead. The main thing I think is that we should focus on our gratitude practice. Gratitude grounds you firmly in your own life. You look inward, examine your life closely, and acknowledge the good people, the positive moments, and the accomplishments that are part of your life's own highlight reel. You stay mindful and present with what's working in your life, even as you have goals to improve that life in the future. We should be looking to find the right people to share our successes with and make a habit of doing that. However small they may seem, we can build on them and we should claim them as ours. Talk about your accomplishments with someone who truly cares to listen. You are seeking a good listener and someone who is invested in your life. So don't talk about successes with casual friends or people who don't care to know about your life. That can be a waste of time. And as they downplay or ignore your successes, it can take away some of your enthusiasm and positive energy, causing you to downgrade them as well. No, we are celebrating successes with people who are capable of celebrating you. So we stay grounded with gratitude and we think about what we're grateful for and we surround ourselves to to the extent possible with people who celebrate what makes us happy and celebrate our accomplishments with us. And we can journal to document our successes, write them down so you can see them objectively and really take them in. You can also see your progress over time, even if it's small or incremental when you journal. Also, to increase awareness of comparison, start noticing when you're doing it and internally reset your thoughts away from it when they pop up. It's like training your mind to push away from comparison thoughts over time. We can find role models who show more sides of their journey to us, whether on social media or in real life. Look for people who celebrate their successes by putting them in the context of the hard work they did to achieve them. Or people who talk about the setbacks along the way, people who present a more nuanced and complete picture of their journey. And we should look for social networks that are less competitive in nature, perhaps a beginner's group on an activity that you are interested in, or a creative group where the focus is on each individual's process and not the outcome. Remember to look for and find friends who support your wins, not ones who are in competition with you or are too self-centered to see and acknowledge your shining moments. And there are also in-person social events. In New York City, I often look for creative networking events, and I found groups that include writers and artists that get together to socialize and connect over a meal. Um, there's also nonprofits like uh, Brick, um, which is in Brooklyn, that support media professionals as they develop their skills with these like fun and interactive classes and events. They have Brick has pitch panels, media maker events. And most of these events are free. I've linked to Brick in the show notes. And if you live in New York and are a media creative, this is a must-have resource. It's really great. Um, So look in the show notes for the link to Brick. And as you tempt down comparisons and stay firmly planted in your own life, I hope your gratitude and fulfillment starts to grow. Let me know how it goes. You can DM me on Instagram or sign up for my newsletter at LetTheFirstFlow.com and reach out to me via email. Today's journal prompts will focus on gratitude, since that's especially helpful for grounding our thoughts in positive accomplishments and situations. Take five to ten minutes tonight to write out the following. One, what situations, people, or accomplishments have made me feel grateful today. Examine your list and take a few moments to connect to each grateful moment. Second, when I allow myself to be mindful of gratitude, how does it color my mood and change my thinking? 
And the third prompt, write about something that seems small or simple, but adds to your life in big ways. Why are you grateful for that small thing? Remember to look inward to examine your life. See what makes you tick, what energizes you, and what makes you proud. These should be a top priority. May you find yourself to be enough, and may you stay on the bright side of the beat. To check out my free podcast, head to my website, lettheverseflow.com, or find me on all major podcast apps. I'll be sharing stories, my original poetry, and music playlists that inspire this show. We're in this together. So reach out to me on Instagram.com, let the verse flow, and let me know what you think and what topics you'd like me to cover. You'll also find extras, like how I create this show and what inspires my music selections and poetry. I hope you'll tune in to Let the Verse Flow to hear my reflections from the bright side of the beat.